You welcome back. This is Breakfast Daily on City TV. Time now to you know zoom into our communities and look at what has been going on. You know, look at stories. You know mm. that probably you know happened um, in the community, yeah. but it has national effect. Yeah. Now, oftentimes we talk about police not doing their jobs mm. properly, police taking money from people, police this, police that. But we also flip the coin, you know, to look at the challenges that they go that through. the police go yeah. through you know yeah, issues of security mm. you know we expect so much security from them but, but who is who, ensuring who that the police the, is yeah, also, also secure yeah, you know yeah, also yeah. safe mm. um look at accommodation issues mm. i mean all the problems that come with being um, a security yeah. uh, agent or yeah. being a police officer yeah. at all now for some time now you know we record a lot of police men police women yeah. dying on duty yeah you know so you you, you leave your family home mm. going to protect people mm. and you never come back yeah. you know and we've yeah. recorded several several of yeah. such incidents now a recent one occurred sometime last week you know we are already nine days just nine days into february mm. and already we are recording such incidents let's take a look at one of such happenings you know from um, the Gumwa area, a report put together by our correspondent, Carl Vistete. It was a sad scene at the family house of the late police constable as her husband cried uncontrollably. <laughs> For him, the circumstances surrounding the person of his wife Will forever bring back memories as he continues to mourn his wife. Police management team led by COP Nathan Kofi Boache visited the family house of the deceased to commiserate with them. The team later visited the crime scene of the incident to get better acquainted with the facts on the ground. Husband of the deceased, Francis Yabua, has been narrating to City News how he heard of his wife's death. <laughs> Hmm. Hmm. Very sad scene. Very there. unfortunate. Yeah. Very, very unfortunate. You know, I mean, a 29 year old officer, yeah. such a young woman, yeah. you know, leave your family and then you Going never to work come back. And you that's know. It. Because and she even said, she even said to him, "Look, wait for me. I'll come back home." You know. Before of course, I mean, when you are plans. going out yeah. in the morning, I mean, we all come to work, yeah. you know. And what you normally would tell family is, "Oh, yeah. um, I'm going to I'll work. See I'll see you later." Yeah. You know, and yeah. then you go, yeah. and you never come back. Very, very unfortunate. Such a young couple, you know, in the line of duty, yeah. you know, trying to protect people, and in the course you losing your life. Now, I've been joined by our security correspondent, Anas Seydu. Anas, welcome. Thank you. Anas, well, so, <clears throat> so this particular incident, I mean, let's zoom into this one, then we'll look at other things. But this particular incident, what's the, what's the lowdown that you can give us on this? Um, was it a case of a hit and run, or was it a genuine accident? What, what, what's really the... And in this case, uh, what I would say is uh, it was a hit and run mm. situation because according to the narration of the people who were at the checkpoint with her, that she stopped the vehicle mm. that was loaded and speeding on the road. Okay. But the vehicle refused, refused to, stop. to stop hitting the checkpoint with her. If we check uh, what they put out, it's, it's always a metal thing yeah. that means is that if you are on the other side of the metal yeah. and a vehicle hit the side, yeah. definitely you will be affected. Yeah. And that was what happened. And when she was stopping the vehicle,
was in the middle of the road. If mm. you get to know how police officers mm -hmm. stop yes. vehicles, because the barricade is there, the checkpoint is mm. there, they expect you, yeah. because it's part of driving regulations, mm -hmm. when you are getting to a checkpoint, yeah. you slow down. Yeah. So they stop you, question you, mm. then you move on. Mm. It's a normal practice. Mm. I think some of these uh, happenings will push police officers, especially those in the field, to review yeah. the way they do some of these yeah. things. At least while stopping the vehicle, mm. you keep a safe distance yeah. in case the driver decides mm. to... Because it has happened a yes. number of times yes. that speeding vehicles kill police officers yeah. at checkpoints and the vehicles are not even identified yeah. to the drivers at large. Now, there could even be a brake failure, you know, because That's these are... True. Uh, vehicles, they are machines, yeah, you yeah. know, so in as much as they probably, so I really agree with you that safety first, you, you know, you so just in case yeah. that vehicle coming has mm, issues mm. and they can't stop, even if they want to, mm. what happens? Yeah, and, and again, I, I think that because we're in the age of technology, we don't necessarily need to put our policemen in the line of danger, you know, because there should be a way to flag down a driver without the police person themselves being in the road, do you see? So that if you want, if mm. you want them to slow, if you, want, if you are signaling that slow down, you get into a checkpoint, there has to be a way to do it using technology without necessarily having the human being themselves in the road. That's, that's possible, but that will be very difficult. Even in developed countries, mm. you still see police officers by the roadside yes. on the motorbike who flag you and use a motorbike, chase after you and mm, signal you mm, to stop. Mm. Remember, the police officers at the checkpoint are not only there to ask drivers to stop, let yeah. me check your goods. They are equally there to be as backup and rapid response in yeah. case there's a criminal activity. Yeah. So for instance, uh, if there's a robbery at Adabraka, and the armed robbers take the circle route yes. one way. Yeah. And you know there's another checkpoint, checkpoint there. down there. Radio they will radio them and mm -hmm. tell them that these people are happening. coming. Yeah. And these are not people you can just uh, use technology and ask them to mm -hmm. stop. Mm -hmm. You need uh, firepower, you need men yeah. to be there yeah. to be able to demobilize them for them to be arrested. Yeah. So they are there serving a number of mm -hmm. purposes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even including sometimes checking mm -hmm. the road where the... Uh, certificate, yeah. driver's license, yeah. and all that. So they do a lot of things. Yeah. For police officers to be positioned at a checkpoint mm. is, is something that can't be done. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I think what I was actually alluding to was the actual moving into the middle of the road mm. to do that. You know, so that once the car stops, then you, move, you, then you come to them, you know. Yeah, so but, maybe like but, a robot but sometime, system, sometime, a robot system that flags. Sometimes, see, if, so you, that if, you, if you look at how the checkpoint mm. is designed, yeah. The safest place for the drive, sorry, the police mm -hmm. officer to be is in the middle. For instance, the checkpoint or the barricade is in the middle of the road. Okay. To allow for vehicles coming from One opposite side. direction to either take left or right. Okay. The police officer is in the in middle. The middle yeah. So if you are going uh, this direction, mm. you use the left. Mm -hmm. You are using this, you use the, the right. right. So he can be here mm. and check both, okay. both vehicles. Maybe when we get to uh, the number of police officers we have in the yeah. system, what the UN requ requirement is, yeah. oh. and the number of police officers leaving the system, retirement, dying on duty, natural deaths, and all that, maybe it will explain mm. why we need more police officers so that these things can be done with. Yeah. You know, so talking about um, going deeper to um, looking at other dynamics, you know, you put a report together, right, that looks at how many people, what the data um, back into the story is. So I think we should um, check that report, but we, we will take a look at that later. But if you can run us through, you know, because you are always on the field, how serious is this issue, police people dying on duty? Um, anybody who understands how uniform police or uniform officers mm. and men work, you know, you realize that the very day you step into training, you'll be told that this work that you are going to do, you have your life and at the same time you don't have your life mm. because you are chasing after people who are criminals. Your work is very serious that you, you could die at any time. Mm. This is made known to you at the training school. 
But looking at some of the deaths, some of them are preventable. Some of the deaths are actually preventable. Mm. To talk about officer safety, you know as a police officer, if you are chasing after an armed robber, to either shoot, demobilize the person, or even arrest the person, you expect them to fire back. Mm. So it is part of their job. Okay. But you see, these people have families that they take care of. They have a lot of responsibility. We can't say that because of the hazards of their work, mm -hmm. it is normal for a police officer to die on duty. If not, every uniformed man knew that any minute they can go. Looking mm. at the numbers, it is left on to... Um, the police service to either describe it as alarming or not we as journalists our job is to mine the data mm -hmm. and put the data out there okay. for instance 56 police mm -hmm. personnel dying in 60 months mm. that's a five-year period mm -hmm. on the average it's almost one police officer per dying month, on month. duty per, per month. month yeah this that's excludes uh, those going on retirement do That's a very high number. Address and, and all that. So yeah. I think when I mine the data, putting the report together, look at 56, 60 months. That's a lot. Right. Now, we have that report, you know, detailing um, the numbers and what actually they mean to our safety. Let's take a look. To serve as a police personnel is one of the greatest honors of a citizen. These men and women do not only leave their families to keep vigil whilst the rest of us go to sleep, but they also put their lives on the line to protect other lives and property. There are numerous police personnel nursing all manner of life-threatening injuries as a result of their service as officers of the law. While some survive terrible accidents and gunshots from suspected criminals, others had their lives cut short. From 2017 to 2021, 56 police personnel have either been killed or died in line of duty within the 60-month period. In 2021, Lance Corporal Emmanuel Kobiose was killed in Accra whilst escorting a bullion van. Ten other police personnel died in the same year. A flag-raising and rate-laying ceremony was observed for the fallen hero. In 2020, we witnessed the highest number of related deaths within the period with 14 police officers losing their lives on duty. The highlight of related deaths in 2019 was the killing of two MTTD police personnel at Budumbram. Sergeant Michael Jamesi and Lance Corporal Awal Mohammed were shot dead by suspect Eric Kojodia. Seven other police officers died whilst on police duties. Twenty-eight police personnel died on duty in 2018 and 2017. The untimely deaths and life-threatening injuries of these personnel mostly bring hardships to their families. As a stopgap measure, President Ekufuado launched a 6.1 million CD police emergency medical intervention fund to alleviate their predicament. I've been assured the beneficiaries do not have to go through the usual bureaucratic and the associated delays which have been in the past resulted in some cases in personnel losing their lives whilst awaiting treatment and the deterioration of medical conditions of some others. As we present the first three beneficiaries of the fund, Chief Inspector Victor Anako, Inspector Theresa Ohine, and Corporal Isaac Esuman Upoku, with amounts covering the cost of medical treatment in Ghana and abroad, I'm hopeful that all police officers who require medical treatment will receive the best of care without recourse to the cost of treatment. Wow, Anas. This, this uh, report is very 
um, very revealing, you know, looking at um, the every year, I think too many people are dying, too mm -hmm. many police officers are dying. There has to be something that can be done to, to, to slow down the numbers. I mean, I don't know what the police hierarchy is thinking. I don't know what the high command is, you know, um, how they are processing this data that they have. Um, but there has to be something that we can do. Definitely, yes. Uh, 2017, mm. 10, uh, 2018, 13, 18, 20, 19, yeah. with 2020 having the highest of 14, and last year, 11. Mm. If you look at that, even uh, in 2016, there were eight people that died. So on the average, you're looking at 10 police officers every year from 2016 yeah. till now. If we look at the number of police officers mm. that we have in Ghana, mm. about 37,000 plus police officers, the UN standard, we, we, we are way back. Okay. We are way behind yeah. the UN standard. The UN standard is one citizen, sorry, one police officer to 500 citizens. Okay. Yeah. We we'll, have. We'll, we'll, we'll delve into the details of those numbers in just a little bit, but we have joining us on um, uh, the Bureau of Public Safety, um, Nana Iyao Akwada. Uh, good morning, Nana Iyao. Good morning, David, and good um, morning to your panelists. Yes, Nanayo, um, if you can kindly speak up a little bit, I can hardly hear you. Very well. Good morning to your panelists and good morning to your viewers. Yes. Um, uh, well, what do you make of these numbers that we are um, seeing right now? Um, unfortunately, it looks as though the people who are supposed to take care of us um, within our communities are also being hard hit um, by you know, various incidents. Well, um, occupational hazard, we call it. Um, I'm happy the kind of um, analysis that I'm listening from the studio is, is quite well thought through. And let me commend Seju for a brilliant work done. Um, in two weeks, uh, maybe in two weeks or less, we will be coming up with our um, annual report on public safety and crime in the country. And we will share with you aspects of law enforcement and, you know, related matters. I believe that when that time comes, I'll be able to adequately um, deal with an analysis report in context. Because as it stands now, um, none of us is able to say whether the deaths are alarming or they are going up or they are coming down. But I'm hoping that in the next few days, we should be able to put um, the report and its content uh, of Seidu and ours all in, in context. Yeah. Having said that, yeah. Go ahead. having said that, mm -hmm. um, we were just to address your question. You indicate you were asking if the death that we are seeing is normal mm -hmm. or is anything to go by. Look, I'll tell you from where I sit after studying the, the realm for in the last 12 years that most deaths that occur in the line of duty with our police service, most of them are preventable. Hmm. Most of them are preventable. We, we are seeing the kind of figures we, we are seeing uh, because of either lack of training or education or inadequate training and education. And I, I believe that this point has been made over and over and over again. In, inadequate know. training on which, which part? Which, uh, you know, is it the drivers? Is it the police? Which side? What are we looking at? Well, um, I believe we are talking about police deaths in the line okay. of duty. Okay. Okay. So we are talking about de-escalation skills. Look, if you should put 10 police officers on the road today, mm -hmm. I can bet you that you are going to get less than two police officers coming back with very good de-escalation skills. Mm. That in a matter that the police have to 
order themselves in such that they will de-escalate matters. They will rather escalate matters. And I've seen it at the personal level. I've seen it at the third party level. And I've seen it several times play out when the police are on the streets working, mm. when they are in the neighborhood working. They do not, they very rarely attempt to de-escalate matters. Mm. And when you escalate matters to the point where it becomes violent, Chances are that if you have a tool in your hand, you are going to use it, you are going to deploy it. And if the other party has a tool in his hand, he's also going to deploy it. Mm. And this has brought, you know, <coughs> expiry to most police officers in the line of duty. Mm. Two, <coughs> uh, what we call a tactical attack. The police usually, I, I know they have the form police unit, which is our version of the special weapons and tactics unit, that's the SWAT. They have the form police unit. I haven't witnessed the form police unit in action before. But I tell you that most of the time that our police have, you know, uh, entered into very hostile um, situations, they've not been very tactical. We have seen instances where the police have even moved in and killed their own. Mm -hmm. That is not tactical. That is not tactical. The, we need to get our police to either we specialize their training so that they understand and, you know, tactical attacks, frontal attacks, and all those things. They really need to come to terms with it because these are modern police methods. Mm -hmm. You know, and mm -hmm. I think that largely to the institution has not been very helpful with, with, with the officers and the men. Mm. There is no reason why in 2021, where over 50, in fact, at the, the figures that we are watching in 2021 figures, nearly 80 to 90 percent of uh, violent crimes were committed with, with, with guns. So there is no reason why in today's 2021, we shall have police officers walking at you, deployed to hostile scenes without, uh, uh, what do you call it, bulletproof, mm. without helmets. Mm. There's no reason why all police officers should not be armed with at least a radio. Yeah. But these are the challenges that, you know, our men and officers, our fathers and wives, our girlfriends, our sisters, they are facing in uniform. Hmm. And so the institution itself must, you know, begin to make some commitments in this direction. Look, as far back as, I think, 2000, I, I may be wrong on this, but at least I know in the last four years, okay, in the last four years, we've, we've, we've been told that we've procured cameras body cameras for our officers. Yes. As to why those cameras to date, several years on, those cameras have not been deployed, still remains mind-boggling. We are not saying that let the cameras come to, the cameras will arrest this. But the cameras are going to serve as a training material. The yeah. images, the data that these cameras is going to collect, is going to serve as a training material to improve policing. Yeah. And as I speak with you, these cameras, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm raising my voice, but some of these things you are so passionate about and it's so difficult to talk about them mm. as if nothing is happening. Mm. These are training content, opportunity to have a lot of these data for training purposes. Mm. We, are, we are missing out on them because these cameras are in and somebody, some minister somewhere decides that I'll keep these in my office. Mm. So, Nanaya, um, just to wrap up on this conversation, exactly what would you propose moving forward will be maybe your top three priorities uh, to modernize the police force? Because, I mean, we, we know the current state of affairs. We know what is also the best international practice. Why, what's the difficulty? Why are we not making, you know, crossing the bridge? Well, yeah, at this juncture, I'll probably employ you to, to, to speak to Professor Christine. I'm, I'm still a student um, studying the realm. But 
having been in this field in the last 12 years, I'm mm. able to tell you that we need to embark on, you know, comprehensive retraining and reorientation of our police officers. Yeah. We need to. We need to let them understand the dispensation in which we are. We need to let them know the tenets of democratic policing. We need to tool them. And to tool them, I'm not asking for billions of dollars to be sunk into their tooling. But a simple gadget as a camera, mm. if we have even a hundred, let's deploy them. Mm. Now we have these things and they are lying down. In the in the next three years, they become obsolete. Yeah. So the taxpayers' money is wasted. Mm. In my meeting with the IGP last year, I indicated to him that, look, for us at the Bureau, this is one of the key aspects, apart from the known traffic uh, areas that we expect your men to be there to serve the, the, their community. We expect to see our officers move about with those body cams. It is one of the key aspects that is going to bring to to to, to the authorities mm. the day-to-day -day challenges that officers and men are facing on the street. Yeah. And it's going to help them or reorient the training methods and their training content. And so for me, if we are able to get these two in place, I think that we will see a massive improvement in policing in the country. Briefly comment on um, the way we've been recently seeing the IGP as well as some of his officers on the ground uh, engaging community members, uh, engaging drivers, and so on and so forth. You know, a lot of the times, it's, it's, it's in a lot of um, um, jest and good humor, you know. So uh, the contribution of that, you know, to, to better policing and better community engagement uh, um, with, 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 with the police. Well, <laughs> the, the IGT is, is doing a great job. It's unfortunate some people choose to describe him in some very unsavory terms. Um, I think he's a hands-on person. He, he's been in office and a year. Uh, some of us are really uh, expecting so much from him, and he's not disappointed so far. Mm. Uh, what we, in fact, that's how policing should be. In policing, you must engage with 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 the public, and I think that this level of engagement is very commendable. What we ask of him in a couple last a few months ago rather was that he should get his district commanders regional commanders to replicate his walkabout mm. it's very important okay because he is one he cannot do it all mm. i want to see the police commander in my region i want to see the district commander of my district coming round the neighborhood and engaging with the members of okay. the neighborhood okay. i want every neighbor to be able to get access to his regional or district commander, mm. so that whatever our problems are, we are able to share. Fantastic. And I, Akoda, we appreciate your thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. All right. So that was the uh, well, Nanaya Akwada of the Bureau of uh, Public Safety. Now we're going to take a short break. We'll come back and we'll get into the conversation with Anas on some of the recommendations that Nanaya has given this morning. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back. And uh, please use the hashtag. We want to hear from you, all right? Twitter, Facebook, wherever. Use the hashtag Breakfast Daily. The WhatsApp line is 0550 uh, And as when we spoke with uh, Nanaya Akwada, there's a number of things he raised, all right? Um, one of them, for example, is that we were promised or were told that body cams had been, um, you know, shipped into the country and that the police were going to be using them. Um, are they using them now? Uh, body cams are not something that's supposed to be secret. Mm -hmm. So if they're using them, I haven't seen them. I must admit, though, I've seen improvement in gadgetry generally across the board, like um, GoPro cameras on their helmets and other things. I've seen them, so it's not as if I've not seen anything. But in terms of body cam, that every MTTD officer should be wearing. Okay, I've not seen any of that yet. Um, so I don't know, you know, what you make of... In 2017, mm. uh, the vice president spoke about it. 
said they were going to procure some. Yeah. Uh, I think that followed the killing of Chief Inspector Ashilevi okay. at the Atomic uh -huh. Kwabinya uh -huh. yes. uh, police station yes. there. Yes. They stormed the police station, killed him, mm -hmm. and they released, them. released, released them. some people yes. who were in custody. Yes. The vice president talked about taking these cameras to the police stations first, and subsequently the interior minister, Ambrose Derry, and uh, the vice president himself mm -hmm. spoke about it again, procuring these cameras. This was like um, some four years ago. Uh, recently, this year, when they were uh, inaugurating the new office complex for the Police Professional Standards Bureau, I was there. The Interior Minister said it again mm -hmm. that uh, the process is almost complete for them to import these body cameras for police officers. Uh, at that point, because of the activity that was going on, having to do with uh, police officer misconduct. Mm. He talked about the service using that to check the attitude of police officers generally in the field, mm. especially allegations of corruption and torture, mm. so that they could be able to, to, to get that done. So talking about cameras, body cameras, I think that's how it started okay. uh, with uh, the current government promise to mm. buy, and it is still in the pipeline, listening mm. to the interior minister just last month okay. when the office complex was uh, inaugurated. Mm. So we can see that the cameras are not in. They are not in yet. The body cameras are not in. Okay. And even the, the last time, what we heard was about 3,000 or so first bite for the various police stations, w which means a lot of them will no, not, not be But talking about them. body cams, they are yet to be used. But that's, that but, also speaks to the priorities that we have. But, you know, I think we should broaden the conversation mm. beyond just body cams, you know, other things. You realize that in recent times, criminals, for want of a better word, seem to have some kind of growing confidence, you yes. know, in engaging in activities in broad daylight. You know, you look at people robbing people during the day. Mm. I mean, until recently, you wouldn't really record huge numbers of mm. broad daylight robberies yeah. look at what happened in just nima you know people seem to not be afraid anymore to yeah. do what they want to do even what when is, their police you know are close what by. is the mentality we had from around the jamestown area you know um criminals attacking bullion vans you mm. know with a policeman inside mm, yeah. what is accounting for this kind of confidence you know among criminals to be able to do their things during the day is it because they realize that they can overpower the police is what is really going on um if you look at uh, the motivations for crime there are a number of them first of all has to do with you getting in touch with a system that is loosed so mm -hmm. that you can easily break through yeah. mm -hmm. secondly the possibility of you getting away with the crime. Mm. Thirdly, you having what is required to, to commit the crime. Yeah. Yeah. So these three factors, once they are at their peak in any society, you are likely to see crime going up and you see criminals operate with impunity. Mm -hmm. What are these? If I know that a vehicle carrying money worth 5, 000, 5 million Ghana cities, and the only person protecting this is a police officer on the front seat by the driver. Mm -hmm. What I need is a sniper behind my motorbike mm. and some information on the route of this particular vehicle. Mm. Two, vehicle two motorbikes, one, cross, uh, one crosses the, uh, the billion yeah, van, yeah. and me carrying the sniper fires at the police officer who can't even hold his gun properly in the in, vehicle in the vehicle mm -hmm. yeah because the ak-47 is too if you long look at the long. size you can't hold it there yeah. and fire the sniper aims at him gives him one bullet he is yeah. dead they get there if we check behind the billion van uh those pickups mm -hmm. molded mm -hmm. pickups driving yeah. around yeah. as um billion van there's just an is just a normal padlock it's pathetic if they use the back of the gun to hit it, it to, it's, broken. It, it's broken and they will just pick their money yeah. and, and go away. That's the first motivation. Second, they know that when they steal these things, the system doesn't have enough to first of all track them and arrest them. Mm -hmm. That's their second motivation. Mm -hmm. When the Jamestown incident happened, police had to go beg somebody's private footage yeah. from his yeah. CCTV camera yeah. to be able to fight that. 
the last time the uh, director general for CID, COP Kenya, will address the media, mm -hmm. these people were still wanted. And when they put out photos, they said these were suspected people. There are people they suspected mm. to, to, to have engaged in that robbery incident that killed uh, Constable Emmanuel Osei. Yeah. And up to now, they've not been arrested. Thirdly, getting the things you need readily for such operations, yeah. guns. The guns in the system should terrify everybody. Mm -hmm. The last time a research was done on arms, it was presented, I think, in 2017. Mm. That's like five years ago. Mm. They stated that we had over 2 million arms in the system. Out of that, one point something were in illegal arms, illegal hands. Yeah. Five years on, just you can even multiply that by two. Mm. Yeah. We have Easily. over 2 million arms in the system. Oh. And if we divide that by the number of people that we have, it means there's a gun to at least a group of people living everywhere. And these are the guns that we able, the system was able to trace. Mm -hmm. There are several more that people have not been able to trace. Every day, people are buying guns because of the level of insecurity. And if I license my gun, it doesn't mean that I cannot use it for robbery. We shouldn't mm. make that mistake. Yeah. Because yeah. if I am an armed robber, then I go to buy a gun. The first thing I would do Ooh, is to license, license it. it. Yeah. So that I can drive around with it. If you arrest me, I'll tell you, I use it to protect my myself. Yeah. Yeah. And I have a license yeah. for it. This is the license. Mm -hmm. And it is, as, it is very easy yeah. to get these arms and get them registered. Yeah. Looking at the system that we, mm -hmm. we have. So basically, seeing criminals operate with impunity in broad daylight, these are the three motivations. Yeah. They have the arms. They know the system is porous. They can go in. And come out yeah. after that incident, yeah. the yeah. Jamestown incident. Yes. The IGP then announced that we had an earlier meeting with the Bankers Association, mm -hmm. and we agreed that they should procure um, bullion vans, bullion vans, bulletproof bullion yeah. vans for that activity, and they were going to withdraw the police. What are we seeing now? They've left the police. They've gone for the military. Yeah. So now you see the pickup molded in the form of a bullion van. And there's another pickup of military men behind it. Assuming this car is passing through circle. Mm -hmm. yeah. And three motorbikes decide to attack these uh, military people who are about six, sometimes eight, mm -hmm. in the pickup. And there's exchange of fire yeah. mm. between the uh, armed robbers and the military people. Just imagine the yeah. scene. Collateral circle. damage. The, 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 the marching orders for the military men yeah in the pickup yeah. is that by all means protect the money. Yes. The armed robbers setting out from home, yeah. they have this uh, goal to go back home with the, the money. money. Yeah. And they are holding AK-47 yeah. with another attached um, ammunition. That's each of us about 70 ammunition. You know, that, 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 that's you know I, I, I think that mm. we should also be looking at the figures, the numbers, you mm. know, with police officers that we are losing. So if, for instance, you have in 2020, 14 of police officers dying, these are the ones who died, I mean, while on duty, mm. you know. Nana Akada also mentioned something about the training, you know, the psychological makeup of some of these officers. I mean, sometimes you watch certain videos and it's embarrassing, you know, a police officer um, lying on the bonnet of a vehicle simply because I want to stop, you know. I mean, how do we try and reduce some of these kind of stuff. I, moving on, I would want us to look at the general welfare, you know, of police officers, the kind of mentality, you know, that some of them have. And also while leaving home, the state of mind, you mm. know, that they, they, they move out with. But some of these things that we experience, some of these things that we see, until recently, that... that um, phrase of the police is your friend mm. wasn't really what the situation was and i think that the igp dampare is trying you know to bring meaning to this but so let's look at you know the numbers against some of these um, practices by some of our police officers out there i'll start with the numbers yeah. um like i was saying earlier uh, we have about thirty-seven thousand police officers which means that for every group of 800 citizens 
we have one police officer managing them, which is uh, way, way, way below. Uh, the UN standard is one police officer to 500 people in, in, in a country. But if we check our police service, out of the 37,000 that we have, there are some that are women. And as we speak now, uh, they are nursing mothers, so they are on leave. Some are pregnant. They can't do other duties except to be in the office. Mm -hmm. You can't ask a pregnant woman to go and chase after criminals. It can't happen. If we take out all that, mm -hmm. you take out the National Protection Unit duties. These mm -hmm. are police officers protecting big men. Mm -hmm. So it means yeah. out of the 800, there is uh, another group that are taking one police officer mm -hmm. to themselves. All MPs have protection by the police, all ministers, mm -hmm. some other appointees. Even people who are not appointees, they Business are not ministers, men, businessmen, pastors. chiefs, they have access to these people, police officers, following them around. So at the end of the day, you have about 30,000. Mm -hmm. We need about 23,000 more to make up the UN standard, mm. excluding these um, selected protections. So talking about numbers, the numbers are not good. Mm -hmm. Secondly, if we have police officers losing their lives in the course of duty, the signal it is sending is that when you step out as a police officer, first of all, don't think about the duty that you are going to do. Mm -hmm. Think about protecting your life. Mm -hmm. Assuming uh, this police uh, lady that was killed mm -hmm. at Gomua Dominas, yeah. assuming she decided to stay in the tent mm -hmm. yeah. and not come out to check a vehicle, mm -hmm. maybe she would have still had her life yeah. with her. Talking about the numbers, that's basically what I can say. But we can say there's improvement. Training. I always believe that the six months training mm -hmm. for police officers is enough. What we need to talk about is the content. Mm -hmm. Just like every other department or even training schools that train people on technical areas, including journalism. Yeah. When you go to a journalism school and you graduate and they bring you to the city newsroom, if you have never worked in a newsroom before, everything here will be strange for you. Yeah. yeah. Compared to somebody who worked in the newsroom and even studied something like uh, something that has no bearing with journalism. Mm. Same with the po policing and the security. Mm. The military, the Ghana Armed Forces, they are trained for six months. Okay. Do okay. we see discipline in them? Yes. Where is the discipline from? This is the the culture. system. When you come into the system, it will shape you and make sure that you go according to what is required. Mm -hmm. When you come to the police, and I can say there have been some, a lot of improvement now. They come out. They are police officers. And my friends in the ser service will tell you that some of the things we see about police and frown upon mm -hmm. are things that are from the training school. Like what? For instance, when you are paid your stipends sometimes mm. in times past, this is somebody who, who trained in... Um, 1996 okay and another friend who trained around uh, 2000 they said as the, the time they were training i don't know whether that is the situation now yeah. when you are paid your stipend you have to put money uh, some little monies together and go and give to your instructors i oh, see wow. for the whole week you will not sleep you'll be on bed and they'll hustle at 2 a.m and ask you to come for more they will take you to the field you run and do all manner of things my hope is that these things have reduced or they've been eradicated at the training uh, school. Mm. It means that as part of their training, indirectly, there's a culture, there's a culture that's been developed. Yeah. You, you get yeah. it. That it's was then. Like I said, I don't know whether that is still the practice now. Mm. But if you have police friends, you can talk to them about some of mm. these practices. Mm. And I'll call on the IGP to look into some of these areas and review the content of the training mm. for police officers. You know, and, and as one thing I also really have an issue with, you know, is um, I don't know if we, we prioritize as a nation our security. I always say that, look, the things that we need to prioritize are not what in this country yeah. prioritize. Security, health, education, mm. you know. And so you realize that when conversations about these comes, is it, we are debating, yeah. should we do it, should we not do it, and sometimes even politicizing it. But these are not it's, things it's a that we should really look at. Look, we have just a police um, um, barracks, barracks yeah, right poli police station in, in police front barracks, of us, yeah. you know. Quite honestly, that is not a place that I would want to live. 
And sometimes when I stand there and I observe that these are the people that I am expecting to protect, to protect as in this me, area. you know, one, mm. they are also human beings. So when leaving home, you know, to their duty post, mm. what is their state of mind? You know, these are family people. And then we are always complaining to so why the police standing outside is unprofessional for them to collect money. Yes, agreed. But the reality on the ground, you know, would this support our complaints? Because if you look at somebody coming from here, you know, sometimes when I, you have to use the ATM and you have to go through, I always say that if somebody doesn't go with me, I'm even scared, you know, <laughs> just <laughs> trying to go. So you are training children in this environment. Yeah. These are also family people. You get where I'm coming from. So how do we change the mindset of police people? How do we ensure that they leave home in full confidence that I'm not here to collect money from anybody? I am here to do my job because I am satisfied with my condition. Uh, talking about internal mechanisms, we congratulate uh, the IGP and his team on what they are doing currently to ensure that if you are a police officer and you do something that you are not supposed to do, you are punished. That is at least a bit deter it's, it's supposed to deter a lot of police officers from going into these areas. Mm -hmm. That is basic and we commend the police service for ensuring that there is some kind of upliftment in the professional standards of their men. But the police administration cannot retool themselves. The police service doesn't have that kind of a budget mm -hmm. to make sure that life is good for them. Mm -hmm. They always run to leadership. They always run to government. Over the past years, uh, we've not seen a lot of infrastructure being put in for police military but once the focus is on police we've not seen a lot mm -hmm. they've been living here in the, the colonial era these are very old police stations and you can go around there are a number of police stations and barracks that are in this nature mm -hmm. that's where the police people live so you are living in a, one room is just a room you convert the maybe the veranda into some uh, like a kitchen, kitchen mm. and that's where you are living with your three, three kids I went to um, Tesano Police Station. Mm -hmm. The house of uh, this constable got burnt. Mm. The whole room is, uh, this studio is like six times. The room. The room. The room is just small. Wow. And he lived there with a kid and a pregnant uh, wife. It's, 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 that's actually more like the average you, police exactly, officer. That's yeah. the space. Which Basically, if you don't want to leave there, you are giving something small at the end of every month as rent allowance. So we will actually call on government mm -hmm. to take a look at this. If where you live is not good, that is the first incentive for you to think about yourself mm. and not think about the country. The work. Yeah. Yeah. I am stepping out, two of my kids, even when I'm going to bed, two of my kids are lying by me, myself and my wife are also lying here. Mm. There is heat in the room because the room is small. I'm thinking about moving out. Worst case is when the, such a person is offering protection mm -hmm. to a big man. He steps out. He goes for his AK-47 at the police headquarters. Then he sits in a Trotsky with every other person. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks to the IGP and his team again, now the shuttle system round. Okay. So police officers are no longer seen carry AK-47 in, in Trotsky. Trotsky. So you go, you are taken hmm. in a bus, and they distribute you at the various places for you to, 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 to do your work. Now you get to this big man's house and realize that his kids, that are even two years, have rooms to themselves. Yeah. And you are thinking, mm -hmm. the moment, the least opportunity, you collect 100 Ghana cities from somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, whilst you are seeing these people live lavishly, your salary finish your salary gets finished Even by the before. 20th of, of of the month yeah so basically there, there's a lot that needs to be done by government we need to have a national conversation about our ghana police service especially giving them enough resources mm -hmm. and these resources should go into retooling them it's not only cars that the ghana police service yeah. need it's not only cars they equally need decent accommodation when you go to their barracks for senior police officers it's always a lively place. Mm. Nine-story building, two-bedroom mm. houses, 
these yeah. and these officers are always not out there exactly. in the public domain. It is these people living in these in the places that look like slums yeah. Yeah. that are on the road, mm -hmm. that are inspecting mm -hmm. licenses, and they will collect money. Of course. Because there is, no, and if, for instance, if I am an AS, ACP, mm -hmm. I know that when I retire, I'll retire with my full salary. Yeah. Mm. Even if I choose to be reckless and not invest, when I go on retirement, I'll even be earning more because at that time I'll not be paying SNIT and yeah. some other things. Yeah. My money will be more and I can do a lot of things. Mm. But you are a constable and your money finish at, uh, on the 15th mm. of the month. Sometimes mm. the money is even finished before you are paid. You've <laughs> borrowed already, <laughs> exactly. loans and other things. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there needs to be a national conversation about this, retooling them and making sure that police officers get their deal from the system. And such deaths, 56 in 60 months could be prevented. Let when the Budumbram mm. issue happened, there was an announcement mm -hmm. that all MTTD officers were going to be provided with uh, a bulletproof vest mm. and armed. Mm. Remember, if you ever get a bulletproof mm -hmm. vest, ask him to take it off so that you just wait. It's heavy. Most of these MTTD yeah. people yeah. who have not gone for any refresher course for the past 10 years, if they wear it for one hour, they'll remove it. Of they course, can't. They, can't. Some can't it. even wear it for one hour. Yeah, yeah. But, but let, let's also look at the fund, you know, that was recently launched by the president, you know, to um, look Take at the, people who, or police officers who probably will lose their lives or get maimed, you know, in line of duty and how that is being helpful. It is very helpful. Uh, before now, police officers were entitled to something small. You know, every job, civil service, and even private sector, when you get hurt on duty, you are compensated, you are given something small. But this is not something that was determined. Mm. And secondly, the money wasn't enough. So the IGP will use his discretion, will give you something, they will treat you. There are people whose treatment will get to a point that they will not be able to, to the system will not be able to support yeah. you again. You have to look for funding yourself. But Thankfully, this is one of the advantages when you have somebody serving in most parts or mo most departments of the Ghana Police Service before getting to the top. Dampare, IGP Dampare was yeah. the Director General for Police Welfare okay. and he had the opportunity to tour the entire country and he visited police officers in their rooms. Mm. Mm. Some of these people were battling with leg fracture, some gunshot wound. Need some amputation. Yes, they were battling with these things. So as IGP, it re he just reflected on what happened when he went to these people, mm. yeah. the kind of conditions they were living in. Yeah. So to lobby for government to come out with 6.1 million fund to help treat these people, mm. I think is, is very good. And it will help the system. The president said something. He said previously, if you wanted to access the fund, because the thing was small, yeah. it was difficult and there were bureaucracies. Yeah. But with 6.1, the likelihood that people are getting, a lot of police officers getting access to the fund and treating themselves. And he even said something that it will take care of the cost of their treatment in Ghana and even abroad okay. if it happens that they have to take you out. Mm. And I think that is good for police officers. If not, there are a lot of people with minor minor injuries yeah. they are suffering mm -hmm. because you are left to be on your own and mm. us it looks like this conversation honestly we could easily go on for another 30 minutes i have like six or seven questions in my mind that i haven't been able to uh, you know, <laughs> get into uh, but thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and uh, opening up this conversation i think it's very important for uh, government leadership as well as police high command you know, to really look at all the issues that we've been talking about. You know, of course, government will take care of welfare, mm -hmm. but police high command needs to look at the issue of training, uh, training in all the different aspects, including something he, Danaya uh, Akoda mentioned, de-escalation. Mm -hmm. You know, because sometimes it's just really a matter of knowing how to talk on the ground, and then it doesn't become, you know, a heightened situation where 
you know, weapons are used and all of those no, things. But, but thank you, you know, very much. You know, I always say that the police officers mm. are also human beings. They are. And just like all of us, I mean, mm. if I'm coming to work and my child is not well, mm. you know, I have a certain kind of Mindset. pressure, yeah. you know, on my mm. mind and I don't mm. want anybody to come cross me yeah. and just annoy yeah. me because I might, you know, just snap, mm. you know. So we also need to look at some of these things, put yeah. the right things in place yeah. to condition their minds and know that this, our safety yes. are in the hands of these people. Yeah. Just Thank imagine you. a day without the police. We all know yeah, that, the, the, that. What does it look like? Tomorrow, tomorrow <laughs> is Thursday, and police people will not be working. Yeah. Just imagine the yeah. chaos. Yeah. And yeah. that's why I launched my attack on you. <laughs> you know that? And also because police can't go on demonstrations. Oh, 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 oh by the way, for, you know, for all you know, somebody will snatch your car at your gate before you even get to work to I launch mean, your attack on you. Oh, Look, the, you know the day I went out to the the, the traffic lights? Yes. That Later that morning, uh -huh. the police lady really wasn't there. You should have seen the chaos at the... At the, at the oh, at she's the, tired. Anyway, anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. All right, so we're going to take a short break. Don't go anywhere. Breakfast Daily will continue.